right. You have a handout. We are back in John chapter 12, and we are in that transition chapter where Jesus has talked quite a bit about believing. And we believe, we see, we free gift. And when we get to chapter 13 through 17, he kind of changes and he begins to talk what we call the upper room discourse. And he's with the disciples. Early on, Jesus is going to leave. And so he's going to have some last words that are lasting words for them. They're kind of the last will and testament. But before we get to 13, and now that we're out of 11, we're in 12. And in 12, there's a little bit of a transition taking place. He's still talking about himself as Messiah, son of man, the Christ. But he's also talking about believing in him. But not everybody does. But even if they do, they don't always follow him. And so he's going to begin to introduce the topic of, shall we say, discipleship. Now, what's interesting in the Gospel of John is in the 12 chapters, it's going to talk predominantly about belief. How to become born again. And then in chapters 13 to 17, he switches and talks to his disciples about how to abide in him. Now that they have believed in him, he wants them to abide in him. Now that they've established a, shall we call it, a relationship with him, he wants them to develop that fellowship with him. So it includes both the gospel teaching and both of those elements. Now, in 1 John, which we looked at a number of years ago, the order is reversed. There he talks primarily about fellowship, and only in a small way did he talk about believing for eternal life. So, in the Gospel of John, its major is belief for eternal life, its minor is discipleship. It's just the reverse in 1 John. But in chapter 12, he's bridging those two topics, and then we'll meet this in chapter 13, where he goes full bore into that. So we're in chapter 12. We started last week. You notice that this is kind of set off by the mention of days. In fact, you can give us the next day reference. So there's a number of um, markers to help us understand the text. One of those markers has to do with the people that he talks about or that he's involved with. And so we're coming to the section in chapter 12, verse 20, where we see a new group of people, right? We're looking at... Uh, this hour of glorification is going to come, and it begins by introducing us to a group of people who are called Greeks, certain Greeks, as a matter of fact. So it begins by saying to us, now there were certain Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast, once again, in reference to the feast tradition. So there's, he's been with his disciples, he's been with Jews, he's been with Pharisees and leaders, and all of a sudden there's this another group, certain Greeks. Not Jews, but certain Greeks, they're going up to worship. These, therefore, came to Philip, who was from the feast of, of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip came and they told Jesus. So it's kind of a little choo choo train, right? Go there, to here, to here. It's interesting that you have a couple of names of Andrew and Philip, and they tend to be Greek. We have certain Greeks coming up, and here these two guys are greeting for whatever reason, saying, We want to we get to Jesus, right? We need to talk with him and see what he has to say to us. And Jesus answered, and Jesus, Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come for the Son of Man to glorify. You see this reference to the hour. Often remember, Jesus said, my hour is not yet here. My hour is not yet come. And now it's come. He says, now the hour has come. And he ties it with the Son of Man. The Son of Man. Now, he's going to mention that again a little bit later. But Son of Man theology is very interesting. Ezekiel was talked to by God as being the Son of Man. But there's another Son of Man in Scripture. There's a son of man that we're going to look at a little bit later in Daniel chapter 7, who is going to come before the Ancient of Days, and he's going to be given a kingdom, and the glory will be his. So we'll take a look at that here in a bit. We also see the son of man in chapter 53 of Isaiah, and it's actually not verse 14, it should be 12, 13, excuse me, not 13, it should be uh, verse 12 in chapter 53 of Isaiah. Because there is no verse 
verse 13. Uh, but in all of this, Jesus is the one who is going to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now, this is an interesting verse. Now, look at exactly what it says. Truly, truly, I say to you. So he's used that introduction a number of times. But what's interesting is this is what's called a meta comment. Isn't it good to learn something new every day? Let me be the first to introduce you to the meta. So what's that? Well, when a speaker stops saying what they are saying in order to comment on what's going to be said, right? Uh, they're trying to get your attention. So when people speak, they spend the majority of their time communicating what they want you to know. However, at times they step back from the actual topic and make a comment about the topic. Like, it's very important that you understand that. Now, I want you to know that. Don't you know that? All, of all the things we have learned so far, the most important thing is that. Notice the repetition of the word that. What is that there for? That therefore is therefore to get your attention. See, he doesn't have to say any of those introductions. He could have just said it. But instead of just saying it, he says, no, I don't want you to just, I want you to really listen to what I'm going to say. So the, that is a way of stopping you and saying, hey, this is important. I better listen up to this. And that's what Jesus wants them to do. He wants them to understand that what I'm about to say is very important. So he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now, this is a simple principle. If you're a farmer, all right, I mean, if you're, you know, you're sowing seeds, you've got to get to the ground, and it germinates. So it can grow. It's a dead seed, it germinates, you life, and then it grows. So everybody would understand that, except he's not talking about just regular seed. So I'm a principle that life naturally does lead to death, but death supernaturally is going to lead to life in his case. But that's not how it always works here, but it is how it's going to work for him. And what he's really talking about is this concept of dying for someone else. He's talking about a theology issue that the Apostle Paul talks about quite a bit. He's talking about the idea of a propitiatory sacrifice. He's talking about the fact that he is going to die for others and offer himself a ransom for many. And by doing that, he is going to substitute himself for us, right? Our guilt and put himself in place with the result that we can be, a variety of words, reconciled, redeemed, justified, all because of this person deciding to die. Like you take a seed and it's got to die, so it can live. If it dies, it can sprout up and be very, very fruitful. So this has got um, embedded in it the whole concept of substitutionary atonement. Right? By the way, they're going up to Passover. Passover. What's well, a feast? What's the feast of Passover for? The blood on the thing that passes over it. And so it's a whole picture of substitutionary atonement. Paul talks about this as the great exchange. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's what this seed is going to do. Unless the seed dies, he won't live and be fruitful. Unless he dies for us, and obviously is resurrected, then we are dead in our sins. Paul will say a little bit later. So what we have here is this whole issue of man being guilty and our sin is imputed to him and God being perfect and righteous, that gets imputed to us. Now, this is a uh, fairly important theological principle. Christ's righteousness, the love animation. How did Paul teach without it? <laughs> no way. But it's a transfer. My guilt to him, his righteousness to me. That doesn't happen unless the seed drops, it dies, 
so it can bring forth fruit. So the death of sin is canceled. Why? Because he took my place. So I like what John Stott says. He says the concept of substitution may be said to lay apart the both sin and salvation. For the essence of sin is man substituting himself for God, while the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. Man asserts himself against God and puts himself where only God deserves to be. God sacrifices himself for man and puts himself where only man deserves to be. Man claims prerogatives which belong to God alone. God accepts penalties which belong to man. Think about that. Think what that means. You were dead in your transgressions and sin. But God made us alive because the seed has to go into the ground and die so it's to live. And the whole theology behind this, in terms of the result, is that we become justified. We can receive righteousness. This is what was talked about from the very beginning. For those who receive Him, to them He gave the right to believe in Him and become children of God. So it, it all starts with who God is at the Son incarnate, the prologue. And then we believe and receive, and we're born again. So Jesus is talking about the same thing. He just keeps using different pictures about the bread of life, and the light of the world, and the good shepherd, and on the door, and all those I am passages are all meant to say, look at me, authority, identity, and I can offer to you something that nobody else can. You can't even get it at the Passover, which is our context here. So Sid McCauley put it all. He said, he who is infinite, Suffered finitely so that we who are finite might not suffer infinitely. That's it. That's the great exchange. That's the thing that the Apostle Paul never got over. He never got over once he realized, I'm not a righteous Pharisee, I'm a wretch. And I met the living, resurrected Jesus, and he told me I was a wretch. And yet he died for my sin. And now all I can do is go and tell people about it, how they can be righteous before the living God, so that they can spend eternity with them. That's the message. And changed. Same thing. It doesn't matter if we live in Russia or if we live in America. It doesn't matter if we're the first century, third century, 21st century. It's the same message. Granted, it's a little more difficult during certain time frames, but it's the same story. So Jesus kind of puts that out there for them to see. He, he says in verse 24, truly, truly, I say to you, unless that grain of wheat, uh, wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now, he who loves his life loses it. Oh, wait a minute. What's this mean? He who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world shall keep it. To life eternal. That's a, that's a strange statement, isn't it? Almost paradoxical. And I just gave us the story of the great way to die and live. But then he personalizes it and talks about us. Right? He who loves his life, he doesn't love his life. If you love your life, you lose it, he says. And he who hates his life in this world shall keep it into eternal life. This is kind of a strange concept, it seems to me. We have to die to ourselves. Well, we need to die to ourselves, live for Christ, and bear for Right. Okay. But that sounds shameful. Die? That doesn't go over well in the Greco Roman world. It doesn't go over well in the Jewish world. Right? There's shame associated with dying, losing, being a loser. You gotta remember in the first century, um, and actually even today, uh, we live in a world where shame and honor are very important. Shame and honor are very important. That's why you find uh, throughout the New Testament, especially, there was the idea of being shamed or shaming your family in the Jewish world, same in the Roman world. Uh, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, despising the shame. Remember that Jesus despising the shame. 
you know, he's going to die on the cross. He said, I don't care that it's shameful. I have something bigger I'm working for. Holy Testament is wrapped around a culture that hated to be embarrassed and dishonored. It wanted, it had ego points. And Jesus says, I'm not worried about ego points. I'll go to the cross. But it's a shame to be on. It's a shame to be on the cross. It's a shame to be strung up. The Romans did it to embarrass everybody. The Jews cursed every man who hangs on a tree. And Jesus says, that's not a problem. Yeah, David. Point, counterpoint. Yeah, the, the, um, uh, there, there are things, I think there are other brands in life that have a subset of life. Not all shame. I mean, there's examples. Um, how the example is uh, building muscle, for example, tear down the muscle and come back strong. How in the world is it? It's a great deal of things that are building muscle. It's all this. <laughs> so, um, work is an example. Knock yourself out and work and you can embarrass yourself. Um, athletes, when they jump into center field and catch the ball, that's what they want. I mean, there's, there's, there's Sunday and such Monday examples of self sacrifice. This is not the third party. Jesus has to play. Self sacrifice. I think we're being told that a Roman one gives you kind of way. There is something. I think we are, and I think Jesus is going to build on that in a minute. But the issue is in this life versus life to come, which is the contrast that he's putting for us. So I agree that there, there is that element in this context. That's not how they would be seeing it. But Jesus is actually going to go exactly where you went here in a minute. Bob. Well, Hodges, Queen Hodges points out that. Uh, Jesus uses uh, eternal life in the future. He's talking about the war. In the past, he's talking about salvation from the penalty of our sin. So what he's saying is that we exchange the life we lived for the one that Jesus can live through us and obey his commandments. And if we do, we have great rewards. So it's always good to have a plant in the audience to kind of Go along. David got us halfway, Bob got us all the way. So let's see here. He who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world shall keep it to eternal life. If anyone serves me, another serve, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall my servant also be. If anyone serves me, the Father will. Honor. Honor. It may be shameful on earth in terms of what people think about following Jesus, but the Father will honor when we follow Jesus. Now, there's something we need to realize. Matthew 10 and Matthew 16 come before John 12. Okay, right? Riding on the colt. Hosanna, Hosanna. That took place a little bit earlier in John. Well, that takes place in Matthew 21, but Jesus in John 12 is actually saying something that he's already said before in a different environment in Matthew 10 and Matthew 16. So what does he mean when he talks about the saving of the soul? Because that's what the word life is. You want to save your soul, you lose your soul. If you save it for my sake, you will have reaping the eternal reward. I think it's your boss. So let's take a look at chapter 10. Notice 
Matthew 10, it starts off in verse 1, having some disciples, or 12 disciples. And then in chapter 11, and when he had finished giving instruction to his 12 disciples. So everything in between 10, 1, 11, 1 is an instruction to the disciples. Well, what's that instruction? And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. And he who has found his life shall lose it. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? And he who has lost his life for my sake shall find it. He who receives you receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. And he who receives a prophet in the name of the prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever the name of the disciple gives to one of these little ones, even a cup of cold water to drink, who may say to you, he shall not lose his reward. So if you want to save your life, you lose it. If you lose it, you save it. And you will be rewarded. So this is a very important message that he's giving to who? To his disciples. And the disciples heard this message in Matthew 10 before they heard what Jesus was saying in Matthew and John 12. But there seems to be a very close similarity. It's talking about losing your life and saving it. If you try to save it here, you lose it there. But if you lose it here, you save it there, and then you will be honored by my Father. So if we went a little bit farther to Matthew 16, again, Jesus is with his disciples. And in fact, just for fun, let's turn back over there to Matthew 16. Okay, Matthew 16. We want to make sure we get the context. Verse 21, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised up on the third day. He would die and he would be raised up. Lifted up and then raised up. But of course, Peter, always with a comment, took him aside and began to rebuke him. Well, now that's always wise. No, oh Lord, but this is wrong here. Uh, good, God forbid it, Lord. That's irony. God forbid it, Lord. I mean, remember who you're talking to, but okay, God forbid it, Lord, that this should happen to you. This will never happen to you. Oh my gosh, Peter. Big mistake. But he turned and said to Peter, and we know these words, right? Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. And then Jesus said to his disciples, after all, Peter's um, frozen after that little rebuke. If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his soul shall lose it, but whoever loses his soul for my sake shall find it. That sounds like John 12. For what will a man be profited if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life, soul? So. Or what will a man gain in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then recompense every man according to his deeds. Now, Jesus is putting before his disciples a concept that he said numerous times, at least three, Matthew 10, Matthew 16, and John 12, if we take that chronology. What's he saying? Well, unless it great if we die, we can't become fruitful. He was going to do that at the ultimate level. He was going to die and then rise again and be fruitful. But he's already told his disciples the very same thing in a way that I'm sure they never forgot. If you were one of the 12 disciples and Jesus just back, back slapped, you know, Peter for being really stupid again, you'd remember this episode, wouldn't you? Peter never forgot it. In fact, he wrote a book called First Peter that's all about the salvation of the soul. Chapter 1, verse 9. So Peter never forgot this. I don't think the disciples ever forgot. It. Jesus had already talked to them in chapter 10, some. Now in chapter 16, in more detail. Peter, you got it all wrong. I'm going to go die that I might rise again. And let me give you guys a principle. If you want your life to count, 
than losing on earth. Because if you lose your life on earth, it will really count in heaven. And it will be tied to what he calls the recompense or the deed. Well, that's, that's found in the wisdom literature, Psalm 62. In fact, that's probably the very thing you've gotten in mind. It's found in Ecclesiastes, the very end of the book, the end of all things is this, fear God keeps the men, so one day every act will come to judgment, whether good or bad. This is everywhere. This is part of the mindset that God is the rewarder of those who faithfully seek him. God is the one who is going to evaluate their life. So it really doesn't matter if you live in communist China in the 20th to 21st century or America in the 20th to 21st century or Cuba or wherever. It doesn't matter because that doesn't have to get in the way of you living a life that glorifies God. It doesn't matter what your education was. It doesn't matter if you got rich parents or not. It doesn't matter. None of that matters. All that matters is if you choose to lose your life, live it in a way that says, the world is not my home. I'm just passing through. Right? That's why it says, don't love the world or the things of the world. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. That's why Paul says in Romans 12, right? right? Leave the world. Right? Don't get involved with it. Sometimes we get a little too involved. Sometimes we sometimes we step over the line with our patriotism and blend it a little too tight with Christianity. Now, you, you know me, I'm, uh, I don't like the uh, some of the things that are going on these days. So I, I have a, a word on that. But sometimes we can blend it to a little too much. We need to be careful. But what Jesus is talking about is you have to decide, Peter, James, and John, and Mason. Mason was not one of the <laughs> You have to decide, I have to decide every day, who am I living for? What am I living for? What is really important? David brought up the illustration of that guy who, you know, he left millions and millions of dollars that he could have had to go serve. Well, he made that choice. He decided it's better to serve Jesus on earth and forego all of that because he knew it was one in heaven. That's what Moses did, right? Hebrews 11. Moses looked ahead and he gave up all the riches and the power of Egypt. Fame, fortune, power, pleasure. That's what he had in front of him. Right? Those four things are what would drive us. Uh, Epictetus, uh, an ancient Greek dude, says that. That's what drives us. Fame, fortune, power, and pleasure. And the problem is we have to decide, I don't need that or want that here. I want to live in a way that's rewardable there. I don't want to be ashamed. I want the Father to honor me. That's what Jesus said. Here in chapter 12 of John, the Father will honor me. I just like to add a comment. We're talking about uh, losing our life here for benefits in eternity. I have to say that in my life, when I lose my life, I have more joy. And when I disregard what God wants me to do and pursue my own stuff, I'm miserable. I'm frustrated. I'm miserable. I'm, I'm a mess. So you know, I you know have to sign up here. You know what that's a sign up? I don't know, schizophrenic. <laughs> Old age. No. <laughs> you know, that's a sign of maturity. That's a sign of recognizing what's really important. That's a sign of sensitivity to the spirit. Prompting, loving you. That's what. Um, he said, it is not for you, Mark, you said it to for the Lord. If you are, you give up the world of that part, most often you can give you back. And he's going to be so considered to be a different way, like with Moses. Yeah, he got the Israelites. <laughs> <laughs> well, he got saved. Well, look, here's what I would suggest. I think Epictetus was right, and Marcus Aurelius was one of the students and, and kind of wrote about this stuff in his meditation. I think they're right. If you lose that here, 
<clears throat> there is a place where you will gain that. Now, it might be gained in a different way here, and that might be part of what makes you solid. But in the kingdom of God, there will be fame and fortune and power and pleasure. Pardon? This the currency exchange. Yeah. Yeah. We invest in the stock market here. The only problem is it doesn't work up here. Right? It doesn't go up. Now, you can use it down here for God's glory. There's no problem having stocks. That's not the point. But if you invest in with stuff that only is temporal, it doesn't transfer up. Right? I mean, see, Bob could sit at home and be watching, you know, reruns of Andy Bigger or Luther Beaver and feel a whole lot of he's going to keep pumping into people to talk to go on Sundays, dry week, and some days it's a fruitful week. Because he's decided this is what's actually important. Why? Because Jesus says it's important. Well, the disciples have a hard time picking up on this. We sometimes have a hard time picking up on this. And one of the reasons is, is because the message in our culture is so loud, it is so brilliant, it is so sparkly, it is so attractive that it draws us. It attracts us. This is what's happening in the millennial world. They are attracted by all the bling. And you know what the church is trying to provide? Christian blame. Christian blame, right? We bring on the Christian dancing bears and the jokers of Jesus and put on the show. We hope that they'll come. That's not really what's going to draw them. I mean, yeah, it might draw some superficial silly people. But but what will really draw them is the power of the inspired word of God and the Holy Spirit and willingness. That is the power source. And I'm afraid the church hasn't figured that out. We're too busy giving them more Christian blame and thinking that's what's going to work. In a word, it is silly. But it costs a lot of money. So what is this salvation of the soul? It is the total transforming work of God upon our lives, which is presently being realized in the midst of Christ-like sufferings and which in the future will be unveiled in Christ-like glory. You see, Jesus gave up his life. He suffered. He died. And then he was rewarded with his kingdom because he was obedient. And Christians, if they are obedient, if they lose their life on earth, they will gain it in heaven. We're not talking about becoming a Christian. We're talking about living a Christian life. We're talking to what Jesus talked to Peter about and the disciples about and this group about. He's talking about living in a way that the Father will honor and glorify. Just like what happened to Jesus, it can happen to us. So the true goal of Christian faith is more than the escaping of condemnation, which requires one act of faith to receive the gift of eternal life. That's John 1 through 11 and some 12. That's the main point. But it's, it is to achieve a fullness of life now and a resplendent glory in the age to come. And this only happens as our faith is mature and as we obtain, and then we obtain as reward the salvation of our soul. In other words, we're developing our character. We're developing our personhood. And you don't have to be wealthy to do that. You don't have to be educated to do that. You don't have to live in America in the 21st. You don't have to live in China. It doesn't matter where you live. You can develop and mature. And Jesus says it's your choice. And if you choose to do it, then you will be rewarded in heaven. Zayn Hodges put it this way while we're referring to that. What I became as an obedient disciple of Christ is what I will always be. By obedience and sacrifice to Christ, I am shaping a personality and a character that is eternal. If I enter this life for myself, for the same things of the world, the personality that I shape and form by that kind of life ends at death. That kind of person is not eternal. So you can make all kinds of money and have all kinds of power and all the fun and fame you want, but none of it transfers out. None of that develops you as a Christian. Again, I'm not saying money's bad. You hear what I'm saying? It's not used properly. If it governs you, you don't govern it. That's why Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, 6, remind those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the wealth. Because we live in this world that can go 
response, right? That Romans 12, 50. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Jesus talks about if you want to save your soul, lose it, you lose it, you save it. It's paradoxical. And for some, it actually meant dying, like he was going to go die. And for many martyrs, it means that. But for us who are not going to be martyrs, I suppose, it's still a choice we have to make every day. Jerry Patillo, who, yeah, I think he just retired as one of the pastors of Northwest Bible Church. He's been there for a long time. He put it this way. He said, in contrast to the character of a man who saves his suke, psyche, soul, in this age, the character of the man who loses his soul in this age for the sake of Christ may be described as sacrificial obedience. Such characteristics will endure and enter into the age to come. Thus, man develops a personality and character which will enjoy the age to come. In effect, he will for eternity be the man he became in this age. But essentially what I just said, he just said a little more elegantly. But the bottom line is, we're in the process of developing who we are. We're in the process of living a life that will either be rewarded or not, recompensed or not. Ecclesiastes 12 says it, Psalm 62 says it, 1 Corinthians 3 illustrates it, 2 Corinthians 5, 9, and 10 gives us the bemacy, Romans 14, the same bemacy. This is a choice that Peter had to make, the disciples had to make, and Jesus said to them again and to us, who are you going to live for and who are you going to die for? So the self-sacrificing pathway of discipleship is in reality self-preserving, for it leads to self-fulfillment in the kingdom of God. In contrast, the self-seeking pathway itself is self-destructive, leaving nothing behind but the shell of the person who lived on earth. You see, let's, let's make sure we're all clear. We're saved by grace through faith, not by works. Period. Justification by faith alone. But sanctification requires work. Sanctification requires a decision to live in a way that puts Jesus first. That's all. Now, I hope that we will get that message and help our millennial friends understand that. They want something that's bigger than life. They want something that's a meta-narrative. They want something that's big and bold, whatever. This is it. It's just not all about acquiring the latest electronic gizmo. It's just not about having a new car. It's not about all the blame. It has nothing to do with the blame. God's not against the blame, but blame gets in the way. What God's interested in is you as a person developing, being authentic, being real, being genuine. You know, our millennial friends like, oh, oh I want to be genuine and authentic. Really? Well, then get rid of all the junk that you're carrying around and grow up. And here's how we grow up. I understand these messages won't play well in front of you. Jesus said, if you endure, you will move. If you do not make that, you will move. Right? If you are faithless, he remains faithful. But some Christians aren't faithful, are they? That's just the way it is. None of us are perfectly faithful. None of us are perfectly faithful. But see, Jesus is talking about how to live your life, how to invest it. And again, it doesn't matter where you're starting from, China, America, rich, poor, educated, not, none of that matters. Sir. My biggest struggle with this was the fact that my parents taught me the job I had, the amount of money I had, and the car that I drove and the house that I lived in, and the schools my kid went to, Determine my value and my self worth and my identity. So, in order to seek Christ, I had to give up my identity, if you will, and say, Okay, I'm willing to be rejected by my parents and siblings. And that was a hard thing to do because we're taught that this is what's important in life and here's my identity. And so, you have to find something else. It's really important to switch. And what did Paul spend a lot of time talking about in teaching Colossians? Our identity in Christ, not in the things of this world, but in the eternal one. Ask it. I'm a little bit confused. 
So what I'm trying to say is, as I develop and mature spiritually, right, when I go and stand before the Bema seat, the Lord evaluates my life and how I lived it, what I lived before, how I lived it, what I did, and he will reward me based on that. So developing who I am now has consequences later. Okay, I'm going back to the first to develop this life will be not have any reward, so to speak, and live. Yeah, so what about the thief on the cross? No, no, I'm sure God is totally fair and will do exactly what's needed. And again, that was pre cross resurrection ascension and establishing of the church. In terms of the church age, Paul makes it very clear. That we will all stand before the beam of seat, we will evaluate our life and reward us. Now, it, we will, is God going to treat me right? Oh, I think God will treat me right. I mean, he's going to be better, better than fair. He's going to be gracious, merciful, but he's also going to evaluate us. But there won't be any more maturity in heaven. Yeah, I, think, I don't think so. I think we'll be done. And there'll be no jealousy. We're not going to be jealous. We're not going to compete. That's going to be gone. Yes. Well, you know, in First Corinthians three, it talks about that, that the wood, hay, and stubble of our life will be burned up, and only the gold and silver and the precious stones that will remain. It also talks about the guy that just barely gets into heaven, and everything's burned up. You know, but when you go, go to the thief in the cross, I love the thief in the cross, and I think he has a lot of rewards because every Easter we read about the thief in the cross that gets saved and say that what does it do in our life? It gives us encouragement. So I think this guy's got more. Or, uh, treasure in heaven. Yeah, more, have, more treasure in heaven than we could ever think of, you know? So listen to watch the knee. Watch the knee. The salvation of the soul demands a spirit of devotion and requires the sanity of reason. Reason that delivers a man from the vanity of the world, the slavery of bodily passion. And understands we are spirit beings that came forth from God and will soon return to God. The spiritual man sees through the vanity of the world, discovers the corruption of his flesh and the blindness of his passions. Yet he is able to live by a law which is not visible to vulgar eyes. He is able to enter into the world of the spirit. He is able to compare and discern the greatest things set eternity against time and choose rather to be great in the presence of God when he dies than to have the greatest share of worldly pleasures while he lives. That's what I'm trying to say. He said it. Right now, it counts forever. Jesus said, What will prompt the man if he gained the whole world? Imagine. Imagine you could have Bill Gates and Bezos and all of them together. If you could have all of it, it's all yours, and yet you forfeited that which is eternal and didn't develop it because you're too busy playing down here. What kind of profit would that be? None. So, again, watch for me. He who in time gets nearest to Christ crucified. Will in eternity get nearest to Christ glorified? Indifference to Christ here cannot lead to intimacy there. Christ's future attitude toward men will be determined by men's present attitude toward him. Now that's sobering. This that is sobering. If that's true, if this is what Jesus actually means about the saving of the soul. Then this should be what guides us. This should be what guards our heart. This should be how we focus each day we get up. A new day, a new chance to excel, but what are you excelling for? What are you trying to do? That's the question. So, got to be more clear. The Bible proclaims 
the immutable truth that God's irrevocable gift of eternal life to all is by grace and faith alone. Ephesians 2 8 and 9, John 3 16, John 5 1 4, Galatians 2 16, not by works. But the Bible predicts the immutable truth that God bestows his praise and rewards or chastisement upon believers on the basis of merit alone. So you read what you saw. So the question comes to what do you want? You want glory on earth, fame on earth, pleasure, power, or do you want to have honor from the Father? Do you want to be glorified by the Father's declaration, well done for the faithful servant? No. So, <clears throat> right now, counts for it. Questions on it. Well, the thief on the cross was right now. He was right. He was right. It's right now. It's right now. Right. right. So it's we think in terms of gee, if I were a young man, I have a long time in long time to change and grow in favor with Christ. But we've got to start right from the yeah. We can't bemoan the fact that well, I got a late start. Well, or that I blew no. fifteen years. No. No. The, issue, the issue is start. Start now. Play the ball where it lies. And, you know, frankly, this, there's, there's two messages here. One is to us individually of what we should be and do. But the second is, how do we help our younger brothers and sisters who, frankly, are so easily distracted by things that are basically worthless? How do we help them focus? Right? How do we get them to focus on their heavenly father? My fear is that the, that the younger generation is trying to substitute what they think is authenticity for a synthetic music show instead of a genuine encounter with the living God. And uh, I, I just, I think we're losing them. I just don't think we're providing for people an authenticity, a genuineness, a supernaturally changed life. That they can look and see and say, wow, that's what Jesus through the Spirit in your life can do? I want that. I want to become that. Don't you think that um, suffering, whether it's everybody or certain individuals, that's what kind of drives you with the sanctification and looking to Jesus and not caring about the things here? And I think if that comes, you know, that generation to be saved, you know, all this stuff is meaningless. You know, I, I think when, when there's, when there's prosperity, it's really hard to see your need for walking close to Jesus. Well, I would say yes or no. On the one hand, some people, some Christians, when suffering comes, it drives you to God for a variety of reasons. Good. And some people, it drives them away from God. Not so good. I mean, it depends on the person. And so we don't run away from suffering because you're right, it helps us grow in the Lord. But not every Christian responds that way. Many of the Christians ran away and, in fact, were ashamed of Jesus. Right? You know, 1 John 3 28, and now little children abide in him so that when he appears, we will not be ashamed of him that is coming, but have confidence. Some Christians are ashamed of Jesus 
and he is ashamed of them. They're still Christians. That's not the point. It's just that you haven't been very loyal and faithful. I just think when you're really suffering and everything's falling apart, I mean, what do you have? You know, I think there can be a point where we don't have to come back. Because, I mean, you, I know, agree. you don't have any drugs anymore. You don't have any psychology. To I agree I that know. that's often the case. Yeah. But I know people who decided not to go to commit suicide. Yeah, they did. So I'm not denying what you're saying. I'm just saying you've lived long enough. I've lived long enough. We know there's another sign of that, unfortunately. Uh, but also, there is the fact that a lot of the millennials don't have any contact with older. Christian have no contact, contact with, with the, the older Christians, and, um, and and a lot of older people don't want to have contact with that that age group, and that's a travesty because they don't have the example. Yep. I had the opportunity yesterday to speak to a lot of millennials yesterday about something, and it and they were curious, just curious about it. So, so it, would it be beneficial if in our class we have a lot of those? 30 year old, 35 year old, younger people, young parents, young married, exactly. young, 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 to interface with this group, right? But we don't do that. So Everything's we, kind of, you know, in the Baptist deal, it's separated by contention, all age based, whatever. In Bible church, you tend to self select and go a different way. But I'm not sure that's what actually happened in the early church. I think all that together. And I think it would be positive and helpful if you had. Younger people learning from older people, but that's learning. Fred, uh, from your experience, uh, how many churches teach reward this dollar? How many of them do that? I would say very, 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 very few. It's been years, other than you, you know, outside this classroom, that I've heard anybody talk. So I don't know all the churches in America. Uh, by the way, watch the memes in China in a, in a persecuted scenario. And he definitely understood the concept. Um, but my guess is with an evangelical church, very, very few. Uh, the reason, probably a number of reasons, one reason is many times pastors are either afraid or confused about the gospel. And so they blend justification by faith and sanctification by faithfulness, and they somehow put those together, not realizing that they're actually separate. So out of fear for teaching rewards, that they would think, well, that sounds like it works theology. They don't know what to do with that, so they don't talk about it. The other reason is they usually don't teach the book of Hebrews, which is pretty significant on this, and a few other books in the Bible that are pretty significant on this, but they shy away from that. So part of it's the diet, and part of it's the theological confusion, so they don't, they don't want to be, you know, they, they don't want to confuse things. But if their desire not to confuse them, they get them confused. And then they leave off a very significant part of the Bible. I've had several examples in the last five years. Just how often the idea of some more is to the money for the lesser of the people to do. You've got the money for all those who don't believe that you're believing. Uh, but then you've got the graphic people who want to get to the key, the one breakthrough I think we had in the conversation with you guys, it was just so off the way. I thought we were going to be done with marathons when I buy it, I thought it was just
One last passage before we leave. Revelation chapter 2, verse 26. Jesus speaking to the church. And he who overcomes, he who is overcoming the night, and he who keeps my deeds unto the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he shall rule under the rod of iron, his vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also have received authority from my father. Jesus was faithful. John 12 died for our sin. Father raised him, he ascended. He was rewarded with a kingdom. Jesus then says to the church, to those of you in the church who are faithful and overcome, I will grant you the same authority that my father granted me in my life. That's not me. That's the teaching not only of the Bible, not only the New Testament, but of Jesus himself. And when we confront people with the teaching of Jesus, and stop getting in the way of it. Maybe people will listen, especially if you pray that the Spirit of God will illuminate them to understand. Father in heaven, help us understand. Help us obey. Help us abide. Help us become what you died to make us. Help us submit to your leadership in our life. Might be glorified. We pray in Jesus' your name. We'll try to finish it next week. Okay.